our concern. So let's, um, where are we going to be first? Go ahead and open your Bibles to Joshua 14, I guess. Well, that'll be our first reference in the book of Joshua. But as you're opening there, let's pray. Heavenly Father, God, thank you for uh, this evening. Um, Lord, we thank you uh, that we're able to gather together, Lord, as your people. And Lord, that we were able to sing, uh, Lord, and worship you. Lord, now as we get ready to just look at Joshua and kind of um, go through and look at some interesting points throughout the book kind of at large and see how it relates, Lord, to other places of your word, I just pray that your spirit, Lord, would give us eyes to see and ears to understand just how, um, how put together, Lord, your word is. Um, Lord, that it's... Um, there were many penmen, but Lord, there's one author, and it's so clear to see in studies like this that, Lord, it's you, that all of this is inspired by you, Holy Spirit, and we're going to try to connect some of those dots this evening. So thank you uh, for tonight. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Cool. So last night I like woke up at, I can tell you exactly what time I woke up, actually 3.30, because I had this crazy cramp in my calf, and it's still sore right now. I had to like get up, it was like a Charlie horse, and you got to like walk them off, right? You can't just lay there. So I was like, ah, oh, and like my bed's on the ground. I can't like roll out of bed. I got to get up out of bed. So I'm like trying to get up and walk it off, but my leg still hurts. So just thought I'd share that with you. Joshua is where we're at right now, and um, we've been studying the book of Joshua throughout the last couple of months. And um, it's such a neat book because it lays out for us how God's people get into the promised land. Uh, we spend all of this time in the first five books of the Old Testament, uh, the books of Moses. It kind of sets up. We have creation. We see that God chooses a man named Abraham. We see that God chooses a nation named Israel. We see that God doesn't just choose a group of people, but he also chooses to give them a place. And that place is uh, the land of Israel, the promised land. And it's quite a journey to get them there. Um, and one of the reasons why it takes so long is because of their disobedience. But in the end, we always see that God is faithful to do what he says he's going to do. So uh, as we see this continue to unfold and you get to the book of Joshua, two main themes happen in the book of Joshua. One, you see that God's people enter into the promised land, but that happens in the first just few chapters. The whole rest of the book of Joshua is now God's people driving out um, the inhabitants of the land that are not supposed to be there. So Joshua leads them in, but then he acts as the general to help drive out all these nations that the Lord says, hey, I want you to get them out of this land. So as we're kind of looking tonight, my, my overall goal is um, essentially I want you to understand that the Bible is um, it, it's cohesive. It goes together. It's an integrated message system that, that even though it was written, well, there's 66 books. It was written over 2000 years by over 40 different authors, three different continents, three different languages. Yet when you read from Genesis to Revelation, you realize that there's these underarching themes and there's these underarching concepts that even though this actually isn't a book, it's 66 books, it is a book because the parallel we're going to look at tonight is that Joshua and the book of Revelation go together pretty neatly. And the fact that it was written, I don't know, 1600 plus years before Revelation was, um, just is so fascinating to think about how much they parallel, which just proves to us that this is God's mind and heart behind his word, not just Joshua's or John's in the book of Revelation. One of the, the key things that we see from the book of Joshua is that Joshua, as a, as a character of the book, um, serves as a picture, as a type of Jesus. Over and over and over again, you can see that, that Joshua is um, representing Jesus. He, he fills that role as being a picture or a type of Jesus who would come later on in the future. Another thing about the book of Joshua that we discovered is that because it's a book loaded with battle... It really helps us understand our Christian walk. And a great book that you can read alongside of Joshua is the book of Ephesians. Because in the New Testament, the book of Ephesians is uh, all about spiritual warfare. Well, a big chunk of it is. Especially Ephesians chapter 6, which deals with the armor of God and all of that good stuff. So Joshua, he, he's a type, he's a picture of Jesus. The book of Joshua is good to be read with Ephesians. 
But ultimately, the point I want us to see tonight is that Joshua also is very much a prophetic book that can be read alongside of the book of Revelation. And those two things both teach very similar principles. Now, it's important for us to realize that, that God's word is a book of prophecy. Like over one third of the Bible deals with prophecy. And prophecy is essentially just God telling us what's going to happen before it does happen. And a lot of prophecy that's been talked about in the word of God has already happened. But there's some that hasn't quite happened yet. There's some, I believe, that we're going to see continue to unfold before our eyes in the not so distant future. But the point is, God's word is a book of prophecy. And probably one of the biggest prophecies throughout the word of God is the coming of Jesus Christ. And that's obviously a big one, especially for us as Christians, right? We should be excited about the coming of Jesus. And when you read the Old Testament... um, Without the light of the New Testament, it can get a little confusing. And that's why the Jewish people at large rejected Jesus in his first coming. Because when you read the prophecies in the Old Testament about the coming Messiah, you realize that um, he's supposed to be a conquering king. He's supposed to set up a kingdom. And yet when Jesus came onto the scene, he didn't come as a lion from the tribe of Judah. He came as a a lamb to be slaughtered. And they said, well, this can't be the Messiah because he's not uh, exercising his political power. What they didn't realize is that there's two comings of the Messiah. There's a first coming and the second coming. And in the first coming of Jesus, he came as the lamb to be slain. In his second coming, he's coming as the lion of the tribe of Judah to set up his kingdom, to get rid of all of the corrupt politicians that exist in the world today, all the corrupt government, and he's going to set up his perfect kingdom, uh, which will last on this earth for a thousand years. Then there's going to be a new heaven and a new earth, and that's going to last there forever and ever and ever. The point is, is that we should be looking for Jesus to return. When we read even Old Testament books like Joshua, our um, eyes should be looking for things that point to Jesus. And so often that message that points to Jesus is that Jesus is coming back. And it's important for us as the church to be a group of people that are watching and aware of the fact that Jesus could come back for two reasons. The first reason why we should be anticipating and watching and expecting the return of Jesus Christ, John tells us in 1 John chapter 3, verse 3, he says, and everyone who has this hope in him, and the hope that he's talking about is the return of Jesus, he says, everyone who has this hope in him purifies himself just as he is pure. So the first reason why we as a church should be expecting and looking and watching for Jesus to return is because it's going to cause us to purify ourselves. It's going to cause us to want to live a pure life because if he could come home at any moment, that should, um, that should, you know, you want to live right. It's like if you're, 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 you're a kid and your parents leave, they're like, we're going to come back. Well, when are you going to come back? We're not going to tell you. It's like, okay, you know, I'm not going to trash the house. If they give me a list of chores to do, I should do it right away because they could come back at any moment. And I want to be sure that I'm doing what I'm supposed to be doing. That's how the imminent return of Jesus Christ works. He could come back at at any moment. Just today on Facebook, I had someone reach out to me with a question and they said, hey, I have a friend in California and she's curious what prophecies need to be fulfilled before the rapture of the church. And I said, none. I said, the next event on God's prophetic timeline is for him to come and get us. That's what we're waiting on. We're waiting on nothing else. The nation of Israel has, always, has already been established. We don't need any more greater technology for the stuff in the book of Revelation to take place. We are, we are ready for this thing to happen. We're literally just waiting for Jesus to come and get us. First reason why we should be expecting Jesus, because it purifies us. We want our hearts set on him. Second reason found in John chapter 14, verses 1 through 6. Jesus tells his disciples, let not your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me and my father's house. There are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. And I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. And where I go, you know... And the way you know, Thomas said to him, Lord, we don't know where you're going and uh, how can we know the way? And Jesus says to him, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the father except through me. Jesus encourages his disciples with the reality of the fact that he's going to come again and get them. And he tells them there that that, that don't let your hearts be troubled. So we should be looking for, our hearts should be focused on Jesus returning, one, because of purification, but two, because of the peace that it brings. If we can know that Jesus is going to come back, that should bring us peace. 
especially as we continue to watch the world go more and more crazy, we can have peace in the midst of the chaos, knowing that Jesus could come back at any moment to take us home. So starting here in Joshua and looking how the book of Joshua kind of parallels with the book of Revelation, the first thing that we see, as I kind of mentioned earlier, is that Joshua leads God's people into the promised land, yet he also drives out those who are not God's people out of God's land. And as you look at humanity right now, one of the many questions that people ask is, you know, why does evil still exist? If Jesus died on the cross and he crushed the head of Satan, which Genesis 3.15 prophesied would take place, um, how come evil still exists in this world? The same reason why God gave his people the promised land in Joshua, they own it, but now they need to drive it out. So my point is that Satan actually no longer has dominion over this land, but he still has influence. Uh, When Jesus died on the cross, he bought back what Adam and Eve forfeited over. Back in the Garden of Eden, God told man that he had dominion, that he had control over creation. But when Adam and Eve chose to sin and listen to Lucifer instead of listening to God, it's as if they signed that title deed over to Satan. And that's why throughout the Old Testament, uh, it, Satan is described as the God of this age, as the prince of darkness. He's kind of had the reins. But when Jesus Christ died on the cross, he... Um, bought back what Adam and Eve forfeited over, and ultimately we see the exchange happen there in heaven in Revelation chapter 5. If you remember there in Revelation chapter 5, verses 1 through 7, there's this great scene. John is uh, taken up. He's having this vision, and it says that, that God the Father has this scroll, and on the scroll there's these seven seals, and Jesus rises up, and he's worthy to take the scroll and loose its seals. We believe that that scroll is probably the title deed of the earth. So that's when that legal transaction takes place in the future. But, but as far as the, the purchasing, that happened 2,000 years ago at the cross. So just like as God gave the land Israel to his people, yet Joshua and the people still had to drive them out, so too um, Jesus has purchased us, and Satan no longer owns this place, but he still has influence on it, but, but he's going to be driven out eventually. We'll get to that later on, but, but we'll see that take place for sure. In Joshua chapter 14, verses 7 through 10, turn there with me real quick, and we'll kind of get into looking at some of these parallel passages. Joshua chapter 14, verses 7 and 10. This is the first point that I want to make to you about how Joshua and Revelation parallel themselves. Joshua 14, starting in verse 7, it says... And this is um, Caleb speaking. Caleb says, I was 40 years old when Moses, the servant of the Lord, sent me from Kadesh Barnea to spy out the land. And I brought back uh, word to him as it was in my heart. Nevertheless, my brethren who went up with me uh, made uh, made the heart of the people melt. And I wholly followed the Lord my God. So Moses swore on that day saying, surely the land where your foot has trodden shall be your inheritance and your children forever because you have wholly followed the Lord your God. And now behold, the Lord has kept me alive. And this is the point. As he said, these 45 years, ever since the Lord spoke this uh, word to Moses, while Israel wandered in the wilderness. Okay, Joshua was 40 years old when they were in Kadesh Barnea. They've conquered the promised land. He's 40, this is 45 years later. So now he's 85 years old. It took 45 years from Kadesh Barnea to where Joshua is at presently, and jo- or where Caleb is at presently in Joshua chapter 14, telling this story. Now this is significant because, and we're going to do a little bit of math here, but you guys are smart, so I think you can handle it. In Deuteronomy chapter 2, verse 4, it tells us this though. Deuteronomy 2, 4. Um, he says, um, and command the people saying, you are about to pass through the territory of your brethren. 
the descendants of Esau who lived in Syria, and they will be afraid of you. Um, Deuteronomy 2.14, that sounds a whole lot better. And the time uh, we took to come from Kadesh Barnea until we crossed over the valley of Zered was 38 years until the generation of the men of war was consumed from the midst of the camp, just as the Lord had sworn to them. Now watch this. Josh, or Caleb says in Joshua 14 that it took 45 years from the time of him being in Kadesh Barnea to where they're at presently, conquering the land in Joshua 14. 45 years. And Deuteronomy, it tells us that they wandered in the wilderness for 38 years. My point is, from the time that they crossed over the Jordan into the promised land was the 38-year mark. From the time that they conquered the land, it was the 45-year mark. And guess how many years is from 38 to 45? Seven. My point is, is that it took Joshua seven years to drive out the land. It took Joshua seven years to prepare the land for God's people. And I find that interesting because in... Revelation, we see, starting in chapter 6, going to chapter 19, this concept of a seven-year tribulation talked about. We, we get that number seven from, because some people get confused with this. Turn with me to Daniel chapter 9, because actually nowhere in the book of Revelation do we see this concept of a seven-year tribulation talked about. And they say, well, how come you always talk about it as a, you know, Bible teacher, yet I don't see it in Revelation because the concept doesn't come from Revelation, it comes from Daniel. And in Daniel chapter 9 verses 26 and 27, we have one of the most remarkable prophecies that exists in the Word of God. One of my favorite all-time prophecies to talk about it deals with Palm Sunday in the first part of it. And later on, it deals with this seven-year period. Let's actually start back in verse 24 of Daniel chapter 9. In Daniel chapter 9, verse 24, I'll try not to spend too much time on this because I could um, get bogged down. But he says, 70 weeks are determined for your people in your holy city. How many weeks? 70. Remember the number 70. That's, how many, that's the totality. 70 weeks are uh, determined for your people in your holy city. This is what the 70 weeks are for. To finish transgression, to make an end of sin, to make reconciliation for iniquity, to bring in everlasting righteousness, to seal up visions and prophecies, and to anoint the most holy. Know therefore, verse 25 says, and understand... That from the going forth the, the command to restore and rebuild Jerusalem to the Messiah, the prince, there should be seven weeks and 62 weeks. The streets shall be built again and the wall even in troublesome times. Okay. First part of the prophecy deals with Palm Sunday and Jesus' first coming. He says, here's the deal. Seventy weeks are determined for God's people Israel. He says, the first part of this prophecy in verse 25 is fulfilled in, and again, you've got to do a little bit of math, but it's not too hard. He says, seven weeks and 62 weeks are determined. Seven plus 62 is 69. 69 weeks. Now, when they say weeks, they're not talking about groups of seven days like we think of weeks, but they are talking about groups of seven, but they're talking about groups of seven years because the Hebrew mind thinks in sevens. We think in groups of 10. We have decades. We have all this stuff. You know, They think in, in sevens. So seven weeks would be seven. Um, well, let's say this. 69 weeks would be 69 groups of seven years. So how many years are we talking about? Well, you take 69 and you times it by 7, and you get the number, um, what would that be? 483. 69 times 7, I believe, is 483. Now, when you take 483 and you times it by 360, because that's how many days are in the Jewish calendar... We have 365 because of the way our calendar is reckoning 365 and a quarter. They have 360. So when you take uh, 360, you times that by 69 times 7. The number of days is what we're trying to figure out here. The number of days you get is 173,880 days. And in verse 25, it tells us that from the command to restore and rebuild Jerusalem until the Messiah, the prince, is revealed is going to be, once you do the math, 173,880 days. History teaches us that on March March 14th, 445 BC, King Artaxerxes III uh, commissioned that uh, the wall specifically in Jerusalem would be rebuilt. March 14th, 445 BC. When you take March 14th, 445 BC, and you add 173,880 days onto it, which we get that number from Daniel chapter 9, verse 25, from uh, 62 weeks plus 7 weeks, 
Uh, that's, yeah, you're tracking with me here. That's 69 weeks, 173,890 days. So March 14th, 445 BC, plus 173,880 days. You count that into the future. It lands on April 6, AD 32. What happened on April 6, AD 32? Jesus rode into Jerusalem on the back of the donkey there on Palm Sunday, revealing himself to all of Israel that he's the Messiah. Everyone shouts, Hosanna, blessed he who's come in the name of the Lord. That's the first part of the prophecy of Daniel chapter 9. Cool stuff, but don't forget how many weeks are determined for God's people in his holy city. 70. How many were accomplished in the uh, Palm Sunday triumphal entry? 69. There's one more group of seven years that has not been fulfilled yet. What is that group going to be about? Verse 26 of Daniel chapter 9 explains. And after the 62 weeks, Messiah shall be cut off, meaning that he's going to die, uh, but not for himself. He's going to die for us. And the people of the prince who is to come. This is the title of the Antichrist. The people of the prince who is to come shall destroy the city and its sanctuary. They're going to destroy Jerusalem. And the end of it shall be with a flood till the end of war desolations are determined. Then he shall confirm a covenant with many for one week. This prince who is to come, who's going to be responsible for destroying Jerusalem, is going to establish a seven-year-long covenant with Israel. 69 weeks have been fulfilled. They were fulfilled 2,000 years ago when Jesus rode into Jerusalem on the back of the donkey. There's one more group of seven years that needs to be fulfilled to accomplish Daniel chapter 9. That um, that video has been paused for almost 2,000 years, but God's getting ready to hit the play button on that as soon as he's done with the age of the Gentiles, as soon as he's done with the church. When the fullness of the Gentiles has come in, you and I are going to go up, and then God's going to hit the play button once again, which starts the, seventh, uh, the 70th and final week, final group of seven years talked about here in Daniel chapter 9. Now, this is interesting because, as we saw back in Joshua chapter 14, it took Joshua seven years to drive the people out of the land. And so, too, it's going to take the greater than Joshua, Jesus, he's going to spend seven years during this time of tribulation. And what is the point of the tribulation? To shake up a nation, to wake up a world, to show them it's a last call, essentially. It's like, we're going ha- to hit rock bottom, and you can either choose to come to Jesus, or you can choose to harden your heart even more, but it's kind of this last hoorah call before life as we know it starts to wrap up. So, Joshua, seven years. Revelation, Jesus, seven years. All of this kind of takes place. Another thing how Joshua parallels with the book of Revelation, we find in Joshua chapter 3, verse number 10. This is actually trickier for me um, than I thought it would be because it's been over a year, honestly, since I've used notes. So I'm trying to work back and forth on how to do this, but uh, um, we'll get there. Joshua chapter 3, verse number 10. Joshua says this. And Joshua said, by this you shall know that the living God is among you and that he will without fail drive out from before you. And I want us to count how many nations God says Joshua is going to drive out. By this you will know that the Lord is before you because you're going to drive out these people. The Canaanites, the Hittites, the Hivites, the Perizzites, the Girgashites, the Amorites, and the Jebusites. Guess how many nations that is? Joshua 3.10. Seven nations. Interesting. God tells Joshua in Joshua chapter 3 verse 10, Joshua, you're going to be responsible for driving out seven nations out of the promised land. Now, in um, Revelation chapter 13 verses 1 through 10, we see that um, John has a vision of the Antichrist. Let's turn there actually because I can, I can read it better than I can summarize it. Revelation chapter, well, maybe not. I'm not that great at reading, but you'll, you'll put up with me. Revelation chapter 13 verses 1 through 10. John sees a vision of the Antichrist who is the political figure who's going to come up and he sees him coming up out of the sea. And he describes him in a rather interesting way here in Revelation chapter 13 starting in verse 1. He talks about this Uh, figure as being the beast. He says, then I stood on the sand of the sea and I saw a beast rising up out of the sea, having seven heads and 10 horns. And on his horns are 10 crowns and on the heads uh, are blasphemous names. 
Now the beast which I saw was like a leopard uh, on his feet. He had feet like a bear. He had a mouth like a lion. Uh, the dragon gave him power, which speaks of Satan. And his, uh, and his authority comes from him from his throne. And he had great authority. And I saw one of his heads as if it had been mortally wounded. And his deadly wound was healed. And all the world marveled and followed the beast. This is the Antichrist during the time of the tribulation, verse 4. So they worshiped the dragon, Satan, who gave authority to the beast, the Antichrist. And they worshiped the beast saying, who is like you, beast? Who is able to make war with him, which we know who is able to make war with him, right? Jesus. Verse 5 says, and he was given a mouth with uh, able to speak great things and blasphemies, and he was given authority to continue for 42 months, which is three and a half years, the last half of the tribulation. Then he opened his mouth and blasphemes against God, and he blasphemed his name, his tabernacle, and those who dwell in heaven. That's you and me. This guy's talking trash about us when we're living with Jesus. Who does he think he is? Verse 7. It was granted to him to make war with the saints and to overcome them, and authority was given to him over every tribe, tongue, and nation. So he's going to make war against the tribulation saints, those who put their faith and trust in Jesus after the rapture. Uh, they'll still be saved, but they're not quite the bride of Christ. That's another study. Uh, we'll get into that some other time. Verse 8 says, All who dwell on the earth will worship him whose names have not been written in the book of life of the Lamb who has been slain from the foundation of the earth. If anyone has ears to hear, let him hear. He who uh, leads into captivity shall go into captivity. He who kills with the sword will be killed with the sword. Uh, here's the patience and the faith of the saints. My point is that as John sees this revelation of the Antichrist coming up out of the sea, he makes note that there's ten horns. And these horns each have a crown on them, and this speaks of ten kingdoms. Okay, now, my problem, though, Hagen, is in your, your point that you're trying to make is that Joshua and Revelation parallel each other in these particular ways, yet Joshua is to drive out seven nations, and the Antichrist is having an allegiance with ten nations. Where do you make the parallel? Well, look at Genesis chapter 14, and all of a sudden, this makes a little bit more sense. Genesis chapter 14... Um, no, I don't want Genesis 14. Let me get back. Genesis... Hmm. I don't want that one either. Which one do I want? Genesis 3.15, Revelation 1, 2. Oh, this is the one I'm looking at. That would make more sense. This is why I don't use notes, okay? And Genesis 15.18, that's the one we want. Genesis 15.18, God is uh, telling Abraham how he's going to one day give Abraham and his descendants the promised land. And the Lord there in Genesis chapter 15 uh, verse number 18 lays out for Abraham that this land that I'm giving you, it's already inhabited. It's already possessed by some people. And this is what he says on the same day. This is Genesis 15, 18. The Lord made a covenant with Abraham saying, to your descendants, I have given the land from the river um, of Egypt to the great river of Euphrates. And notice, let's count these nations starting in verse 19. The Kenites, the Kenizzites, the uh, Kadamites, the Hittites, the Perizzites, the Rephaim, the Amorites, the Canaanites, the Gergesites, and the Jebusites. Guess how many that is? That's 10. So my point is when God tells Abraham about the promised land, he says there's going to be 10 nations that you're going to have to deal with. Yeah, you know, when Joshua comes onto the scene in Joshua, um, we see that there's only seven nations to deal with. So somewhere along the line, three of them end up missing. And we learn, this is where it gets kind of interesting. We learn in Daniel, Daniel chapter 7, verse number 8, God says this. I was considering the horns. This is back to the vision of the Antichrist that Daniel sees. And there was another horn, a little one. That's the Antichrist, the little horn. Coming up from among them, all the other horns. Before whom three of the first horns were plucked. Ten minus three. That's where we get our number seven from. So we still see this parallel happening throughout Joshua and Revelation. That just like Joshua is responsible for driving out these seven inhabiting nations, we're going to see that in the future, the Antichrist is going to be set up with ten kingdoms, yet three of them, for whatever reason, we don't know quite yet, Daniel tells us, are going to be plucked away, turning the ten into seven. Interesting. I don't want to lose you too much in the detail of this, but the point that I'm trying to get across tonight is that, is that this is an integrated message system. That, that Joshua, there's no way that Joshua, 1600 years before John, could write this 
in and of their own ideas. This is not just some abstract idea that even very creative authors have. This is divinely inspired by the, the, the Holy Spirit of God without a doubt. In Joshua chapter 10, verses 1 through 14, another example of how Joshua parallels the book of Revelation. Joshua chapter 10, verses 1 through 14. This is the, the great uh, part how uh, he's fighting and he prays and he has the sun stand still. It says, and it came to pass when, and here's the character we want to come familiar with. It came to pass when Adonai Zedek, king of Jerusalem, heard how Joshua had taken Ai and utterly destroyed it, as he had done to Jericho and uh, its kings, so he had done to Ai and its kings, and how the inhabitants of Gideon uh, had made peace with Israel and were among them, that they feared greatly because Gibeon was a great city like the one of the royal cities, and because it was greater than Ai, and all its men were mighty. Therefore Adonai Zedek, king of Jerusalem, sent uh, Hosham, king of Hebron, and it goes on to list these kings. Now, in Joshua chapter 10, we're introduced to this character named Adonai Zedek, and he's the king of Jerusalem. And literally, Adonai Zedek, and those of you guys who are familiar with Hebrew know that Adonai speaks of Lord. Lord, Zedek is righteousness. Adonai Zedek literally means Lord of righteousness. And he's the, the king of Jerusalem. Jerusalem is also a compound word. The word uh, shalom, shalom is in Jerusalem. So it's literally the place of peace. So here you have the Lord of righteousness who's king over the place of peace. Now, when we read that, our first instinct would be, well, maybe this is a type or shadow of Jesus. Yet we see Adonai Zedek is actually a bad guy, not a good guy. Because he's actually the second king of Jerusalem that's mentioned in the Bible. The first king of Jerusalem is not Adonai Zedek. The first king that's mentioned back in Genesis 14, 18 through 20 is Melchizedek. Adonai Zedek, Lord of Righteousness, second king mentioned in the Bible of Jerusalem. Melchizedek, first king of Salem, but it's Jerusalem. You got to understand the geography. It's talking about the exact same place. The first coming king, Melchizedek, he's the good guy. He's the one that Abraham gives a tithe to. He's the one who gives Abraham, guess what, two elements, bread and wine. Very interesting. Melchizedek gives these two things to Abraham, pictures of communion. When you read the book of Hebrews, you uh, round chapter 7, you realize that Melchizedek in Genesis chapter 14 is either the pre-incarnate Jesus or a really strong type of Christ. I personally believe it is Jesus himself back in the Old Testament. So the first king of Salem, of Jerusalem, is Melchizedek, the good guy Jesus. The second king, Adonai Zedek, that comes onto the scene, who appears to be the prince of peace, yet it's a false peace. This is a great picture of the Antichrist, because we know, as we've kind of already established, that the Antichrist is going to come onto the scene there in Revelation chapter 6, the first seal that is open, uh, the rider on the white horse. Many get confused thinking that that's talking about Jesus Christ, but that's the Antichrist who's making a false peace agreement with the nation Israel. That's going to be the first thing that starts the tribulation period. The rapture of the church actually doesn't start the tribulation period. Some people get confused on this. I had a conversation in our parking lot about a month ago with someone about this. The rapture actually could happen 10 years before the tribulation period. It could happen one day before. It's probably going to be a lot closer period of time than a large gap of time. But the point is the 70 weeks of Daniel doesn't start with the rapture. It starts with the peace agreement that the Antichrist makes with God's people as laid out in Daniel chapter 9 verses 27 and 28. So here we see that Adonai Zedek is a picture. He, he appears, he's the, the, the Lord of peace. He's over the city of Jerusalem, yet he's not the good guy. He's the bad guy. He's against God's people, so much so that we learn that he's actually out against. Notice here in Joshua 10 verse 4. Adonai Zedek, he wants to um, wipe out. He says, come up to me and help me that we may attack, notice who, Gibeon. For it has made peace with Joshua and with the children of Israel. Remember the Gibeonites in Joshua chapter 9, the previous chapter. 
They, they duped Joshua for a minute. They pretended like they were travelers. They dirtied themselves up. They said, we've been traveling for days and, and weeks, and, and we're just sojourners. But they were actually setting them up. Joshua calls their bluff, and they go, okay, you're right. We tried to deceive you, but, but let's make a peace agreement. And they make peace. The Gibeonites make peace with God's people. And the point is, because the Gibeonites made peace with God's people, um, Adonai Zedek, who is a picture of the Antichrist, wants to destroy them. Joshua 10 verse 4. Who is the Antichrist going to want to destroy during the time of the tribulation? Those who will not bow down and worship him. Who are those who are not going to bow down and worship him? Those who have made peace with Joshua. Not Joshua the son of Nun, but Joshua Jesus Christ. Those who make peace with Jesus during the time of the tribulation. Not Adonai Zedek, but the Antichrist himself is going to want to try to destroy them. Interesting. The fifth thing we see how the book of Joshua parallels the book of Revelation. We're close. I'm on page four. I only have six pages of notes, so we'll see how this goes. Um, this is in Joshua chapter two, verse one. And again, I might be losing you on some of the details. Hopefully you were with us on our Revelation study. Some of this is sounding highly familiar. If you missed out on that and you're not familiar with um, our Revelation study, you're probably way behind, but just catch up. Just listen, listen closely. Joshua 2, 1, it says this. And uh, it was told the king of Jericho saying, behold, men have come here tonight from the children of Israel to search out the country. So in, there in Joshua chapter two, we're dealing with Rahab. And remember, Joshua sends two spies into the promised land to spy out um, what's going on. Now, ultimately, as you read Joshua chapter 2, you realize that these two spies, they're really not spies at all. They're actually witnesses. Because instead of spying out, God has a divine encounter for them to meet a Gentile woman, by the way, whose name is Rahab, and they're able to uh, lead her to the Lord in the way, unique way that they know how, and having her hang a scarlet cord outside of her window so that her and her family are spared when the Israelites come in to overtake the city of Jericho. Joshua, in Joshua chapter 2, sends two spies into the land. They're not actually spies at all, they're witnesses. And in Revelation chapter 11, verses 1 through 14, we see that Joshua, Jesus, sends two spies during the time of the tribulation period. They're not spies, they're witnesses, just like the ones back in Joshua. Revelation chapter 11, verses 1 through 14, speaks about these two witnesses who are going to come onto the scene. And these are going to be some, some cool guys. And I don't know if we're going to be able to see this from heaven, but I sure hope so, because this is, this is going to be a neat scene for sure. Uh, Revelation chapter 14, verses 1, it says, Then I looked, this is John seeing this vision. He says, Then I looked, and behold, a lamb standing on Mount Zion, and with him 144,000, having his father's name written on their foreheads. So this is speaking of the, the Jewish uh, evangelists. Oh, Revelation 11. I'm in Revelation 14. Revelation 11, 1 through 14. My self-diagnosed dyslexia kicking in. Revelation chapter 11, verses 1 through 14 says, Then I was given a reed, there we go, like a measuring rod, and the angel stood saying, rise and measure the temple of God and the altar and those who worship there. But leave out the court, which is on the outside. We get some measurements taking place in verse 2. Uh, verse number 3 says, and I will give power to two witnesses. And they will prophesy 1,260 days, which is three and a half years or 42 months or times, times and a half a time. All of these are synonymous phrases in the book of Revelation, the last half of the seven-year tribulation period. They're going to have power to prophesy in Jerusalem uh, for my name's sake for 1,360 days. They're going to be wearing sackcloth and ashes. Verse 4, these two witnesses who he sends, they're like two olive trees and two lampstands before the God of the earth. And if anyone wants to harm them, fire proceeds from their mouth. How cool is that? And devours their enemies. And if anyone wants to harm them, they must be killed in this manner. Someone comes against you, you just breathe on them and they're going to be consumed. Verse six, these have power to shut heaven so that no rain falls on the days of their prophecy. One reason why I believe one of these guys is Elijah. 
because Elijah was an Old Testament prophet who had the power to shut heaven, and they have the power over water to turn them to blood. Second guy, I believe, is Moses, because that's a prophet or a miracle we see Moses involved in. Could be anyone. I personally believe it's Moses and Elijah. That's not the point of tonight, though. The point is that Joshua sends two witnesses, and so does Jesus. Goes on here to say in verse number six, and to strike the earth with all plagues as often as they desire. Verse seven, and when they finish their testimony... I love that. I'd love to go down that road, but we can't. But the point is, when they finish their testimony, then the beast that ascends out of the bottomless pit will make war against them and overcome them and kill them. It's not until they're done with their testimony that they're able to be taken out of the game. And so too, I'm so confident in this verse that for you and me, we are safe in God's hand until until we're done doing what he wants us to do. Verse 8 says, And their their dead bodies will lie in the streets of that great city, which spiritually is called Sodom and Egypt, where also our Lord was crucified. That tells us exactly what we're talking about, the city of Jerusalem. Then those from the people's tribes, tongues, and nations will see their dead bodies for three and a half days and not allow their dead bodies to be put in the graves. These two witnesses are going to be killed. Their bodies are going to lay in the streets of Jerusalem for three and a half days. Everyone... Peoples from tribes, tongues, and nations from all over the globe are going to be able to see these guys laying in the streets of Jerusalem. And those who dwell on the earth will rejoice over them, making merry and sending gifts. They're going to make a holiday out of the death of these two witnesses uh, to one another. They're sending presents to one another because these two prophets tormented those who dwell on the earth. Here's what's fascinating. In the book of Joshua, Joshua sends two witnesses into the promised land. In the book of Revelation, God is going to send two witnesses during the time of the tribulation. Back in Joshua chapter 2, we see that as um, Joshua drives out these witnesses, um, or uh, as, um, let me back up here. I'm getting ahead of myself. We have these two witnesses, both parallel, Joshua and Revelation. The, the, um, The two witnesses in the book of Revelation, they were killed and they lay out on the street for three days. That's interesting because we see that in the book of Joshua chapter two, we see that there's, there's a three day period of time that's mentioned there as well. So you see the three days both mentioned with these witnesses that God and Joshua sends forth to spy out and to take care of the work of the Lord. There in Revelation chapter 11, we see that all the globe is going to recognize or is going to be watching what's taking place in Israel and Jerusalem at this time, and it's so neat to read uh, old commentaries and see them to try to explain this. It's fun to listen to teachings even back from the early 2000s because everyone is thinking, oh, the way this is going to happen is because of CNN. It's like you have no clue. The way that this is going to happen is because of this. The way everyone in the world is going to be able to see what's taking place in Israel when these two witnesses die and rise again, it's not because they're watching cable news. It's because they have everyone's Virtually either has this or you're sitting next to someone who has one of these and you're going to be able to watch it all unfold before your eyes, which proves that the technology that we need for the book of Revelation to unfold already exists on the earth today. Okay. We see there in Joshua chapter 2 how Joshua is going to overtake Jericho through the power of God. And when you do some study on Jericho, Jericho, um, the the, the people that dwelt there, they worship the moon god. And I really don't have the time to get into this, but it's so interesting that there in Joshua chapter 2, God gives Joshua the power to overtake those who worship the moon god. And when you see how that parallels maybe end times events, um, which religious system has a crescent moon as part of its symbol, Islam. And there's a very interesting parallel between the battle of Jericho and the conquering that takes place there. And I believe what will happen in our future in the end times between Islam and uh, Christianity. So interesting things to take notes of. We also see that there in Joshua chapter... Well, it's actually in chapter two as they're marching. If you remember when they're marching around the city of Jericho, God says, here's what I want you to do for a whole week. I want you guys to wake up and I want you to walk around the the walls. Okay. What else? That's it. Can we shout? You can't shout till the last day. Okay. So they're all excited. They finally get to the seventh day. They, they, They hike around it seven times. On the seventh time, there's the blow of the trumpet and then they shout and then the walls come crashing down. 
This is interesting because in Revelation uh, chapter uh, 6, we see that with the, the, um, the seals, there's some trumpets that are blown as well. And when the seventh trumpet sounds, just like when they marched around on the seventh day and blow that trumpet on the seventh day, then a great shout. In Revelation chapter 6, there's a trumpet sounded at the end of the chapter. And it's interesting because once the trumpet is blown, then there's noise. But before that, it talks about how there is silence in heaven. It actually tells us for about a half an hour, which is interesting. But before there in Joshua, God tells his people, you have to be quiet. You can't make a noise until the seventh trumpet sounds. In Revelation, we see that there's silence before the sounding of the trumpet. And again, those are just similar parallels that we see unlaid before us here as we look at Joshua and Revelation kind of hand in hand. In uh, Joshua chapter 10, verses 16 through 20, and this actually, I believe, this is my second to the last point. In Joshua chapter 6, um, verses 10 Joshua chapter 10. Thank you. You guys know what I want. I don't even know why. I don't even know why I'm here. Joshua chapter 10, verses 16 through 20. That's where we're at. We see um, the story continuing on here in Joshua. And as it says there in Joshua chapter 10, verses 16 through 20, it says, but these five kings had fled. So this is after they've uh, conquered Jericho. They're moving on to these other lands. Uh, these kings get word that Joshua and God's people are after them. They're afraid because they've heard of God's faithfulness in battle. So they're actually fleeing. It says, but these five kings, they fled and they've hidden themselves in caves at uh, Mecca. And it was told Joshua saying, the five kings have found hidden in the cave. Okay, you just read the same line twice. So Joshua said, roll a large stone against the mouth of the cave and set men by guard of them. So these kings run into a cave to try to avoid Joshua. Joshua goes, well, that was stupid, right? Let's just block off the entrance. So he has his guys roll a big old stone in front of the cave. He sets two guards to guard it. They're trapped in the cave. Joshua defeats their people as their leaders are stuck in a cave because they hid and then he's going to go back and deal with them it says in verse 19 of joshua 10 it says do not stay and do not stay there yourselves but pursue your enemies and attack their rear guard and do not allow them to enter their cities for the lord your god has delivered them into your hand then it happened while joshua and the children of israel made an end of slaying them with a very great slaughter till they had uh, finished that those who escaped entered fortified cities and all the people returned to the camp to Joshua to uh, Mecca in peace and no one moved his tongue against any of the children of Israel. I like that. No one talked trash about God's people of that generation again because they just, they just saw God do a mighty work. Now the point that I want to make here is that these five kings, when Joshua is whipping them, they flee and they hide in caves. Revelation chapter 6, verses 12 through 7 tells us this. John says, And I looked, and uh, when he opened the sixth seal, and behold, there was a great earthquake, and the sun became black as sackcloth of hair, and the moon became like blood, and the stars of heaven fell on the earth as a fig tree drops its late figs when it is shaken by a mighty wind. Then the sky recedes as a scroll when it's rolled up, and every mountain and island was moved out of its place. Some massive shaking is taking place here. And the kings of the earth, the great men, the rich men, the commanders, the mighty men, every slave, slave and every free man hid themselves in the caves and in the rocks of the mountains and said to the mountains and rocks, fall on us and hide us from the face of him who sits on the throne and from the wrath of the lamb. For the great day of his wrath has come and who is able to stand? These kings in Joshua flee from the face of Joshua because Joshua is out to defeat them. In Revelation, the kings of the earth slave free everyone during the sixth seal as the earth is being shaken up is hiding in caves and rocks. And they're saying, we want to hide ourselves from the greater than Joshua, Jesus. Interesting parallel that happens there. One last point, then we can wrap things up tonight. The last part, and this is the last chapter of Joshua, Joshua chapter uh, 24. We talked about this one last week. Very famous verse, Joshua 24, verse 15. You probably have it 
hung up on your wall at home? Joshua 24, 15. He's uh, old at this stage of the game, Joshua. He's 110 years old. He's commissioning the people one last time. He's encouraging them to choose the Lord. He actually gives the people a choice. That's what he's given them. It says, and if it seems evil to you to serve the Lord, choose for yourselves this day whom you will serve, whether the gods which your fathers served that were on the other side of the river or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you dwell. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Joshua lays out for the people at the end of the book of Joshua, a choice for them to make. And so too in the book of Revelation, at the end of the millennial kingdom, guess what people are going to have? A choice. Because Satan has been bound for a thousand years. The tribulation ends. The tribulation ends with the second coming of Jesus. Jesus Christ comes back riding on a white horse. You and me come back with him as his bride as the church. Jude verse 14 says that he comes back with ten thousands of his saints, which just means a whole bunch. So all of us come riding back with Jesus in his second coming, and we land there uh, on the Mount of Olives. His foot splits the Mount of Olives in two. Uh, he walks from the Mount of Olives. Uh, he goes across the Kidron Valley. He goes into the temple where the Antichrist is uh, or has set up his place. Uh, he overturns some stuff there, the altar, the abomination of desolation, all that stuff. He works his way from uh, Jerusalem over to the, um, the, uh, the valley of Megiddo, where the battle of Armageddon is going to take place. But um, I hate to burst your bubble, but it's not much of a battle. Because all the Bible tells us in Revelation chapter 19 that's going to happen is Jesus is going to open his mouth. And with the sword of the word of God, these intelligent military powers we're going to be wiped out just by him opening up his mouth with the sword of his word. And then he's going to deal with all that. He's going to take the antichrist. Who's the political figure. He's going to take the false prophet. Who's the false religious figure. He's going to take Satan. Who's the dragon behind all of this. And he's going to throw them into the lake of fire for a thousand years. Revelation chapter 20 starts. That's where we see the millennial kingdom take place. You and I, we're already resurrected. We're already in our glorified bodies. We've already been living with Jesus for seven years in heaven on a honeymoon. Now here we are back on this earth. This same earth that we live on now, we come back to. It's been messed up quite a bit. It's been shaken up a little bit. You know, things might look a little different. But this is the same earth that Jesus is going to rule and reign from Jerusalem as he builds uh, his temple there in Jerusalem. He sets his own throne up there in Jerusalem. And you and I, as his servants, now as his bride, are going to rule and reign with him. What does that mean? I don't know, but it's going to be awesome, okay? We're in our glorified bodies. We're never going to get tired again. We're never going to get cramps at 3.30 in the morning again. See, I knew I'd work it in there somehow, okay? We're never going to have any sort of problems, physical issues, because we're in our glorified bodies. And for a thousand years, which is a long time, you know, I'm, there's some old people in this room, and you're not even close to a thousand years, right? When you think about a whole, all of history that's happened in a thousand years, and we read it like it's this. That's going to be a long time that we're just working for Jesus. And our job is to be sure that righteousness is happening in the world. Satan is bound. So people no longer have his influence at the moment, but they still have their flesh. And the people that we're ruling and reigning over are those who are alive during the tribulation period. They're still going to be able to have families. The earth is going to populate. We're done with that part of our life is done sailed, okay, because we're in our glorified bodies. We're not having kids, but they are. Let's make that clear. Uh, but, but we're just ruling and reigning. We're taking care of it. But at the end of the thousand years, the Bible tells us there in Revelation chapter 20 that Satan is released for a small period of time. Why? Joshua chapter 24 verse 15, so that people can choose. So now these people that have lived in this utopia for a thousand years, not even knowing the influence of Satan... Now, Satan gets released for one last hoorah to see if anyone who's been living under the rule and reign of Jesus Christ, literally physically on this earth, wants to say, um, I choose the bad guy over you. And God is going to give them that choice. And the Bible actually tells us that many people during that time are going to choose to go with Satan. And then after that, we see that the great white throne judgment takes place, Revelation chapter 20, uh, 21. And those who choose to follow Satan in that last hoorah after the millennial kingdom are going to be cast into the lake of fire with the Antichrist and the false prophet forever and ever. Now they're there for all eternity. Uh, all of that is done. 
you and I, we've already been judged. Our judgment as far as salvation took place at the cross. Uh, the Bema Seat judgment took place right after the rapture. Our judgment is done with. Those who are faithful to the Lord during the time of the millennial kingdom, they get judged at, um, they get, um, they're separated. They're sheep and the goats. Remember that, Matthew 25? They get separated out. These guys, pff, the bad guys, we'll call them the goats because that's what the Bible calls them. They get thrown into the lake of fire. The sheep, though, they go this way, and they get um, their resurrected bodies as well. Then this earth, as we know it, gets destroyed. We get a new heaven and a new earth. We all live happily ever after. The point is, is that God gives them a choice there at the end, just like Joshua, at the end of his book, gives the people a choice. He says, you got to choose this day whom you're going to serve. You want the gods of your fathers? You want Satan? Or do you want to serve the Lord? Joshua makes a clear uh, line in the sand. He says, as for in my house... We will serve the Lord. A lot of stuff, a lot of stuff maybe that just kind of went over your head and I talked too fast and gave you the wrong cross references so you weren't able to follow along. But again, my point that I just want you to walk away with tonight is how Joshua, a book that was written 1,600 years before Revelation ever was, um, speaks of very similar principles, foreshadowed things that John had no clue as he was on the island of Patmos writing would be uh, looked at in 2020 at Calvary Chapel Salmon as parallels. But we, we see passages like this. We connect these dots. We're able to stand back and we're able to say, this is more than just a cool book. This is what makes the Bible so special because it is God's word. And you see the Holy Spirit's fingerprints that connect these dots from Genesis to Revelation. With that, let's pray. Heavenly Father, God, we thank you for this evening. And God, I pray that um, you would just be with us as we leave here tonight. Um, Lord, if the only thing that we walk away with tonight is just realizing that your word is cool, Lord, that would be enough. So, uh, God, that's what we're asking for. Lord, thank you that um, we were able to just study the book of Joshua over these past couple of months. And, Lord, that we were able to look at tonight, Lord, just these interesting parallels. And, God, I pray that we would just be encouraged, Lord, in uh, realizing that we are um, living, Lord, in the end times, Lord, in the last days. And Lord, as we started out with tonight, Lord, our hope needs to be in you. Lord, we sang about that. Lord, we talked about it. And Lord, with that, we're going to have purity and we're going to have peace in our lives as we're just waiting, Lord, for you to come and get us. But Lord, until you do come, Lord, our job is to occupy. Our job is to be about our Father's business. So Lord, I pray that we would do that. Lord, we just thank you for your word. Lord, particularly for the Old Testament. God, thank you that we're able to, to study it and see it in light of the New Testament and just see how it all fits together. And God, I pray that we would just kind of think about these things that we looked at tonight. Lord, keep us safe as we go home. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen. Next week, we're starting the book of Judges. Judges is an awesome book. That's where we find later on in the book, Samson, great Bible character. So read ahead if you want, probably Judges chapters one and two.